and kicking off, Diane Mosa, heading from the United States, um, from the Vermont College of Fine Arts in Montpellier, and the New School for Jazz and Contemporary Music in New York. And as far as I know, you already had the chance to experience her piece um, as part of this conference. Um, so today, uh, she will give a lecture, a performance on exactly that piece, bird songs, and she will um, ask question how music can engage, teach, and transform the general public's view of acoustic ecology and ecological awareness. So, have fun, and now it's your turn. Okay, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. So thanks everybody for being here today. As you can see up here, that uh, I wrote that this paper is part of an artist talk, part about my creative process and it's part reflective and about the experience that I've had in this birdsong project, which I've been doing for 10 years now. And it's also about my compositions, my music compositions, which were embraced by the community and how their reactions fueled me to go further to figure out exactly why this was a different type of experience for me as a composer and a performer than all the other projects that I do. And that's the question that I kept asking myself. Why is this different? What is, what is going on here? So before I can tell you why it's different, I need to tell you a little more about myself. Um, let's see if I get the right thing. There it is, okay. I am a pianist and a composer. Um, I've played with, I've done everything from solo piano to playing with orchestras, writing for orchestra, dance companies, theater, small ensembles, jazz, contemporary music, um, uh, you name it, I've done, I've been there. And I've, and I've written for it or I've played it. Um, I also have my own ensembles. The top picture that you see there is Diane Moser's Composer's Big Band. It's a 17 piece big band. I wonder, I felt like I had another, wait a minute, hold on a minute. No, that's, Okay, it's a 17 piece big band that I formed uh, in 1997 with the idea of developing and presenting new music for big band. So it's not Glenn Miller, it's not Tommy Dorsey, it's not uh, your typical, it's not Count Basie, it's, it's new music for big band. I've brought in over 100 composers and performers and we're celebrating our 21st year in doing this. And we used to work like every every month. I used to produce concerts every month to do this. So to say that I've worked with a wide range of composers would be an understatement for that. I also have a quintet that I call the Diane Moser Quintet. Um, my last, re which features Ben from left to right, Ben Williams, uh, trombonist Jerry Hemingway, drummer who now lives in Switzerland. Uh, there's me and then Marty Ehrlich who on the recording plays alto and clarinet, and Mark Dresser, who I've been working with, bassist, who I've been working with since 1978, so 40 years we've been working together. Uh, Jerry, I've known for 39 years, Marty, I think 38, 37, Ben, only 27 years. So, <laughs> long association with those guys. The uh, last album that I put out with them, or that I, that I, that I wrote, and produced uh, was a commission from an organization in America called Chamber Music America, which you apply to get a grant to write for your ensemble in, the, in their jazz category. So they gave me the money and I wrote a piece based on James Thurber's book, The Last Flower. And um, then I got some money from New Music USA, which allowed me to record it and to produce it and to release it, which I did in 2014. So that's a little part of what I do there. Um, I'm also a, um, uh, most people primarily obviously know me as a jazz pianist, experimental contemporary music. I also play classical music, all types of music. The only, only type of music I've probably never done is heavy metal. There's not a lot of room for piano and heavy metal bands, so it's not really, a place for me to be, um, but I also uh, am an educator and at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. It's an MFA music composition program, 
and um, New School for Jazz and Contemporary Music, where I do composition and performance ensembles. So again, my whole life kind of revolves around composition and music, new music, and all different types of new music. Um, I've received a lot of composition awards, as I just mentioned, Chamber Music America. I'm also a fellow of the McDowell Colony, which is the oldest artist colony in America, and uh, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, which Anne is also a, a fellow of, and the uh, Malay Colony for the Arts. Um, I also play the pipe organ, and I'm a music director at a church, as if I don't have enough to do already. <laughs> but I actually really enjoy that. And I run a choir there, and, and uh, that choir is uh, full of burgers, by the way. And I'm also a part of the deep listening community, which who knows what deep listening means. Yes, Christina. Anybody else? OK, can you name who that person is that invented it? Pauline Oliveros. Thank you very much. I just want to make sure. Pauline Oliveros, who is no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, I'm also a community organizer. I, right now, I sit on the board of um, an organization called Seed Arts in Montclair, New Jersey, where I live. And we produce free concerts for the public and events for children. Um, listening sessions. We have a listening session every month. Um, we have an art parade. And then we do produce festivals that um, do, because we get funding for that, are very low in cost. And we have uh, one that we're starting to work on. So again, I say, why is this project different from all the other ones that I've worked on? And what I finally decided is that it's because of the conversations that I have with audience members and the musicians and my students after I do my bird song project, after we perform it. So I've written this music. I'll tell you about that in a minute, how that came about. But I've scored it for, obviously, solo piano. You heard that last night. Uh, a duo with Mark Dresser. It's on an uh, album called Duetto that we released in, or Civ Records released in 2012. Um, it's on another recording. Uh, uh, some bird songs are on another recording. I could list them all, but I've also scored it for my big band. So, and ensembles in between. So, I kind of, that one of the nice things about being a composer slash performer, or performer slash composer, so you get to arrange your music for whoever you want to put together to have play it. Um, and so the conversations that are different, just to give you an idea about the conversations I normally have after, let's say, a big band or a quintet concert or solo piano, would be something like an audience member who, after telling me they like the music, would say, oh, your music reminds me of, and then name a famous pianist like, Possibly Jackie Byer, because I studied with him. Uh, it reminds me of McCoy Tyner, or Mary Lou Williams. Or they'll tell me the genre that they like, or they'll tell me, oh, have you listened to so-and-so? And they'll name some artists. Um, and, and they'll ask me, you know, did I see this performance? So it's, it all revolves around that style of music. But when I started doing the Birdsong Project, my, converse, my conversations drastically changed, which got me thinking about how this was affecting the general public and what else could I do with it. So now the conversations are more like, I felt, so, so, and jazz critics, and by the way, the Birdsong CD has been reviewed in everywhere from a jazz magazines, blogs, classical magazines and blogs, a heavy metal magazine, believe it or not which was pretty funny, and I couldn't believe it was there. Uh, contemporary fusion, just kind of all across the board, which is another thing that would never happen if I was just doing a straight ahead jazz album. That would never happen. So the fact that it reached all of these different people, again, was signaling to me, there's something about this music that is different. Um, so now when people talk to me about after a concert or they've heard the album on the radio or a jazz critic or whatever, a music critic in general, they'll say something like, I felt like I was, when I was listening to your music, I felt like I was walking in the woods. And then they'll tell me about their most recent walk in the, wood and in the woods and what birds did they hear and what are their types of sounds. And 
where did they go for the walk? And they'll ask me if I've been there before, have I heard that bird? Of course, the number one question I always get is, do you know Messiaen's work <laughs> on birds? If I had a euro for every time somebody asked me that, well, I would be a very rich person at this point. But that seems to be the one thing that everybody knows. Um, another uh, conversation I've had is somebody said, I heard a chickadee this morning and I thought of your composition, Hello, which is I played last night. And it's based on the two note song of the chickadee. Um, another comment has been listening to your music uh, makes me listen more intently, more deliberately, uh, which I'm really glad to get that comment. Uh, another one is I can't relate, I, I can't not listen to bird songs and not think about your music. So. So now we have this connection. So just by virtue of listening to this music, now there's a connection to nature, which I, I didn't think was going to happen. This was a, this is complete, took me completely by surprise. And I had been thinking for a while since this has been going on for 10 years now. I've been thinking for a while. Well, what you know? What's the next step that I can take with this? Where where else can we go? So I've been working on uh, trying to connect with people in the scientific community and do more about deep listening workshops and uh, sound walks and et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that um, I was thinking about, there's been so, such great conversations here and, and wonderful presentations, but something that came up today, which seems to come up almost every single day, is the listening outside and the listening inside. We just talked about this with Hildegard on the sound walk, uh, uh, Alexander, uh, when he did his uh, presentation, I think, right here, right? In his 3D audio, was talking about the same thing. This seems to be a common theme that's going on here. And I can say that through this music, this, this happens simultaneously. There is no like, you're outside and then you're inside. It happens at the same time. Because the music that I've created, I created with the birds. So you immediately feel like you're outside, but you're inside at the same time. Which I think is a pretty special place, a pretty special process to be able to happen like that. Um, through these last 10 years, people have sent me photos of birds. They sent me articles about birds. They sent me articles about the environment. Um, they send me gifts, like tea towels with birds on them, or stationery. It's just, just been, I, would, I, I can't even explain how unbelievable that is, because I don't get that with all of the other music. I get a lot of accolades, no doubt. People tell me all the time they love the music. But to go in this direction, I never planned on this. This was not my intention. It just happened to be who I am and what I wanted to create. It's, it's a result of that which is the reason why I came up with the title that I came up about music being able to teach and engage and transform the general public's view about acoustic ecology and ecological awareness, because those are the conversations we're having now. Um, musicians have told me that when they hear the concert, they'll tell me afterwards that uh, instead of listening to it as a jazz concert, they put all of those frames and references aside you know, we all go to concerts and think so-and-so is going to sound like such and such. We put them in a little box. We have a category. And uh, musicians are no different, of course, because we play a lot of music. So we're involved with a lot of projects. But the musicians tell me that when they hear this music, they don't think about any of that. They only listen, which I just think is an incredible thing to have happen. And that, again, that's not something that normally happens in the rest of the jazz world, or the contemporary jazz world, or even the avant-garde jazz world. That doesn't happen like that. But with this project, that's what's been happening. So there's another step towards acoustic ecology, is that they are listening deeper than they've listened before. The musicians that I work with, which you'll see up here, Anton Denner, flutist, Kim Filiano on bass. Here's our recording here, uh, engineer, John Gu. We recorded this in a church because I love the acoustics in this church. And it just makes the flute just like soar. 
So that's why I hired John to come in and do it as a live recording, uh, which has, if anybody's been involved in live recordings, there's a lot of a lot of problems you can run into in that arena. But and it takes a little bit of finessing when you're editing and mastering uh, the recording itself. But the sound that you get is really incredible, and that's another topic that's been here about space and acoustics and. Um, and that's why I picked it, because I knew that the harmonics of the piano, the bass, and the flute would just be totally heightened in this room. So we went for it. But they have told me, especially the flute player, Anton, has said to me that he plays differently when he plays this music. So again, and now Anton is one of the most respected musicians in our area, in the New York City area. He, gets, he is constantly working. People call him all the time for all kinds of projects. And his wife actually told him, who is this incredible Latin jazz pianist, who said, you know, I've never heard you play like that before. And what that means in jazz speak, I should say, is that there all of those references to jazz licks, jazz quotations, that's all gone. Instead, his improvisations, you know, there's one thing, we play the music, but we do a, a lot of improvisation on this recording. But the improvisations come from the music, and the music comes from me working with Bert. So it has changed the way that he improvised. It's totally changed the way I improvise, at least in this type of scenario. I still have my jazz licks and stuff, for the big band and what have you. But um, even his wife noticed that. I mean, he noticed that but even his wife did. So again, another step towards acoustic ecology, another step to ecological awareness, just by virtue of playing the music. No going to a class for a semester, no, <laughs> none of that. Just playing the music, this happened. Um, which again tells me that there's something powerful about doing music in this way that will touch people, that will get them to listen, and might possibly get them to do something else after that. Um, uh, I, I have to tell you a story about my son, who was 39 years old. Um, he was camping, uh, had a camping weekend up way upstate in, uh, in New York on a lake, on an island in the middle of a lake. And of course, they all brought their own little personal generators so they could hear their music. And it was, you know, it's bass and drum beats or oriented. And he said that an owl started hooting on the downbeat with this particular track. So it would be, hoo, hoo. And then <laughs> it went, and a whippoorwill. And he came back from that camping trip and he said, I now understand what you're talking about. Because the owl was singing with us. And they were probably playing it really loud, I imagine. So the owl was probably like feeling the vibrations, I would imagine, in his body and started singing. So it wasn't my music, but it was further evidence that birds will interact with you when they feel the vibrations and when they hear the sounds. Um, uh, most of the members of my choir at the church where I'm the music director uh, are birders. So we've organized some bird hikes. Uh, we're going to start doing some deep listening workshops together. Um, all, again, because of this project, because they know what I'm doing. They've come to my uh, concerts. Uh, so again, another step towards acoustic ecology. After I give, uh, after I play this for people, and, and in my teaching life, when I give workshops on deep listening, and, uh, the history of Armory Schaefer, the methodology, his music, if you haven't checked out his music, I know we've had a lot of conversations about this here. Some people only know him about the tuning of the world, and some people know a little bit about his music, but I, I urge you to go and listen to his music, which if you go on the Canadian Music Center website, just set up an account, it's free, and you go to his profile, there's a ton of MP3s on there, and you can hear lots of his music. I highly recommend the string quartets, and I think they've been playing them in the lunchroom, is my guess. That's, that's when I hear it, that's what it reminds me of. Um, but after I've lectured my students about bird songs, Armory Schaefer, Hildegard, uh, acoustic ecology, et cetera, et cetera, it sparks something in them 
they compose using the methodology. They'll go out in the woods, they'll record bird songs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, another step towards acoustic ecology, environment, just through the music, just through the, the act of composing and the, the act of listening, the act of learning about composers who use them, which I also give a lecture on bird songs and the composers who use them. So as I said in the very beginning, these are very different conversations for me. And this is why, uh, I mean, it's not a different conversation when I talk to birders, although bird people tend to have a different category of music that they listen to. But it's a different conversation than what I normally have with my audience members or my musicians or students. When we start talking about the bird songs, that's when all of this comes to light. So this is what gave me the idea about this in the first place. Um, <coughs> so I want to talk a little bit about how I did this, which is in that cabin in the woods. This is the uh, cabin, a studio at the McDowell Colony. Um, it started in, I'm going to say 1907, I believe. Uh, there are, I don't remember how many acres, it's a lot of property. And there are 20 something of these type, not looking exactly like that, but studios in the woods all over. So it's for composers, visual artists, sculptors, writers. Um, I was just up there in August for uh, uh, their metal day and uh, uh, hadn't been there for a while. So it was really nice to revisit. And actually, they've redone that cottage. But this is where I lived for five weeks. And in, you'll see in this picture, this is the inside of the studio. This is a Mason Hamlin Grand. And you can't really see this, but there's a micro VR over here. Mm -hmm. And I would take a microphone and put it in that window. And just because I didn't really have any way to do isolation, put the curtain over the microphone. I figured it was better than nothing. And put the, you know, put in the headphones so I could really hear the birds outside. And then as they sang, I would improvise with them. And I did this every day for five weeks for about four or five, six hours a day. Not, not in one long stretch, you know, a couple hours, have lunch, a couple more hours, have some dinner, trying to get the nighttime birds. Um, and this was my process. Here's uh, another side of the, of the studio where I'm looking out at the woods there. And so I do escape, and then I go over here. Let's see if this thing pops up. So what I brought was a recording, one of the original recordings that I did in the studio. And this, originally I called this Me and the Chickadees, and now it's called Hello. So this is the one that's based on the chickadees. I gotta warn you, it's gonna be very hissy because I haven't done any noise reduction on it at all. When I, I have to add that, so all of these recordings that I did, I transcribed the music. Some of it, a lot of it note for note. Uh, some of it just the basic mm, ideas. Uh, it just depended on what the improvisation was. And I would spend the evenings listening to this music over and over and over and over and say, okay, this part I think is a real composition right here. So all of this music is born out of improvising with the birds and the birds improvising with me. This one, we'll see how it sounds on the sound system. you hear them? This is me. Do you hear the chickadee? That's a chipping sparrow.
saying, I always answer, just to make sure he knew I was there.
is on the rest of that recording. And once I came up with that bass line, which utilizes not only the two note sparrow song, but also when I'm doing the trills, that's the chipping sparrow. I don't know, the melody just came to me and I just took it off from there. I just went with it. And the birds continued to sing with me the whole time. And sometimes the wind would blow through and so that's why I'm like doing arpeggios and, and et cetera, et cetera. So unlike most other composers, and I'm not really, maybe you guys can tell me differently, most people like, they'll go do like Messiaen, for example. He went out, he was an ornithologist and had perfect pitch. And he would go out and just like write down the bird songs, come back, put it all together. And a lot of times his stuff is like note for note. Not necessarily thinking about like, okay, where is this harmony going? It was more like he wanted to, he wanted to emulate what he had just heard. Um, other composers will use bird songs and write more extended harmony with it. Um, John Luther Adams' latest project was that he wrote out all of these different bird songs to and and gave it. He had musicians like 20, 40 musicians in a park gave them all the slips of paper and said, okay, play whenever you want to play. But the one that he did previous to that, he actually had harmony and structure and stuff. This one I'm doing is with the birds. So I always feel like I have to give them credit because they are my co-creators on this. It wasn't just me. Um, where do I, I go to, is it here? Where I, to get the big one? You know, it's in the middle. Can I help you? Yeah, yeah. Here. <laughs> oh, thank you. Some more pictures of, thank you so much. Some more uh, photos of, of that area. I love this photo on the left. I recorded a bunch of hermit thrushes there that morning. This, that photo on the right was behind my studio. I would go for walks back there, um, and and so forth. So, in preparation for coming here, after I proposed this and I wrote everything down, which what's in the book is really a full account of the last ten years. So I'm I'm giving you the shortened version of that. But I decided to do this little music and nature survey on Facebook, which I know is not very scientific, but I was really actually more interested just in the gen, because that's my topic, the general public. I didn't need to know demographics, I didn't need to know gender or age or any of that, just generalized. What's the reaction to listening to music that has a nature theme? So I had 79 people that responded. Uh, uh, 77 of them had listened to some type of nature music, probably because they follow me. So you have to keep, that would be the one marker I would say we'd have to keep in mind. Um, most of them listened, heard <coughs> some type of nature theme music that was in the jazz, pop, rock, blues type of vein. Uh, the other half was split between classical, electronic, world music. Uh, and somebody said, right up at the theater, and which Ann pointed out to me that, well, it's because they do it in nature. And I went, oh, I did, I did not put that together. Do you guys know what bread and puppet is in, in Vermont, in the United States? This is a puppet theater that has puppets this, like the size of a second story building, second, third story, like humongous puppets, like bigger than this. And they do workshops in the summertime and they do big parades and they do music with it. So I, I must be why that person put that there. Um, when I asked them, uh, uh, listening to this music prompted, did I, listening to the music prompted them to find out more about the specific nature theme. Um, this was interesting because for a while, if the yeses had it, and then all of a sudden the no's started to build up. So. 33 said yes, 46 said no. Except that I'm not sure about that because as we go through it, you'll see that more people were involved in seeking out more nature-themed music than before. 
Um, when I asked them if they took any action when they saw it, most uh, people said that they went online, online and used a search engine to find out more information. Um, nobody went or sought out lectures. Uh, few people read some books. Most people, even more than online, and this is something we want them to do, went out for a walk or went boating or did some sort of outdoor activity so they could do what? So they could go out and listen. So again, listening to music got them to go out and listen. So now we're back to acoustic ecology. Um, I asked if they had joined a nonprofit like the Audubon Society or anything. Only one person said that and nobody volunteered. I'm gonna have to work on that with my audience to get them to volunteer. Um, and then there were other responses to that. Some people said that they composed music using a nature theme. Uh, some said that, you know, it never did anything for them except for dancing. That's an interesting response. But another one said that, um, uh, he says the cicada, he didn't spell this correctly, but I just wrote down exactly how they spelled everything. The cicada of the night insects was, or a lullaby to me. I became aware of the competitiveness of the different sounds. I even had a conversation with my daughter about the fact that Mother Nature has created everything to keep us alive. It's like, wow, that's a pretty profound answer. Um, people, there were people who said no. Uh, I love this answer. I become more attentive of the sounds around me on a day-to-day -day experience. Uh, enjoyed the sounds, wrote a piece, meaning a music composition. Um, and et cetera, et cetera. I asked them, are you following this composer, the one that they had listened to? And then it's like it's flipped from the one that said that about finding out more stuff. It was 3346, now it's 4633. So yes, they are following them. Uh, from your listening experience, would you want to seek out other composers or ensembles that record and perform major theme music? 63 said yes. 13 said no. So now we're getting more of a positive response. Um, name some of your favorite nature theme listening experiences. And this is crazy because this is all over the map. Maria Schneider, of course a lot of them name me because I know these are people who know me. Uh, look at this list. I don't know if you recognize any of those bands in there or any of those compositions. Uh, of course, Messian shows up quite a bit. Um, uh, Respighi, Pines of Rome. Uh, Peter and the Wolf, that was an interesting choice. Um, somebody said Bernie Krause. Um, John Cage, Pauline Olivero. So it, it was really all over the map in terms of what people listened to. So again, this is a thing that shows that people are listening to music. And if we want to reach, which seems like to be Part of the goal of what Murray Shaper was talking about and Hildegard Westerkamp and Eric Leonard said in their organizations about getting people to listen. They are listening to music that has a nature theme. And, and it would be a great thing if we could get the composers who are writing for you know, traditional instruments together with soundscape composers and electronic composers to join together on all of this, because I think this is a way that we can reach more people to talk about acoustic ecology. Um, I asked them if they learned something new. Uh, 52 answered yes. Um, nine said, oh, 52 answered. Nine said no. Three said no, but I listened to this album because my grandmother used to play it for me. Um, so that was interesting because the other answers tell me that yes, they did learn something. Uh, could be just the way I asked the question. Uh, 40 responses that showed they did have an experience that added to their life brought more awareness to listening, hearing, awareness about nature. So they said that they learned about the birds of paradise. They learned uh, conversations and patterns present among various species of birds. Uh, nature theme music can be a simple or complex fabric wo woven from many sources. It highlights the essence and beauty of the natural world. That's pretty profound, okay, and, um, and so forth and so on about nature and music. So a lot of responses there. 
I asked them how important it was. Um, somewhat important got the most. Uh, but and people who are curious in 26, very important, soothes my soul. So I just think that the power of music and music, you know, especially in the way that I was doing it, or anybody else. Obviously, there is a big one list that we can get across to people about the elements of acoustic ecology and ecological awareness through music and help lead people down that path to get them to listen more intently. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Diane Moser. So um, we really have to uh, highlight what kind of pleasure it is for us to have you here. You're oh, really working thank at you. the intersection of new music, jazz music, but also acoustic ecology. So that was really interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here. So um, I would be glad to open up the discussion. And I also know that there are some people um, around who are also happening to be um, in love with bird songs. So I'm pretty confident that there will be some um, questions coming from the audience. Does anybody have any questions about the process or survey or life in general? No, I'm kidding about that. <laughs> We'd be here for another 20 weeks. <laughs> so now you have the chance. Oh, over there. I question um, So how do you... So it's very instructive to hear your recording that you made at the McDowell Colony while you were listening to the birds. You were kind of playing with the birds, right? I'm not kind of. That was, that was totally definitely. the goal. Yeah, the, so, my goal was to be a member of their band. Right. So, so how do you con sort of think about the other stuff that you were doing that wasn't what they were, what you were imitating? So when you weren't doing the imitation or you know attempted sort of trying to figure out what they were doing and how you could translate it to oh. the piano. Yeah, so I that's know what one you thing, mean. right? Yeah. You did that. But then you also had this other stuff. Right. right? The improvisation. Mm -hmm. So how did you decide to do that kind of improvisation? I mean if it was me, it would do the same thing. It would have sounded totally different because I'm not a jazz musician and but I play the piano. So I would have done a whole different thing. So how did it come about that you chose that kind of stuff, and you probably have like this vast array of abilities in piano and set music styles, right. right? So you could have chosen, you know, other things to do. So why did you decide that? Well, I don't think I chose it. Ah, it chose you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. When I improvise, I it's like the what I was saying to Helgard to, today on the sound walk that when we were at the sculpture. When I closed my eyes and listened to the sculpture, I immediately, my brain went to music composition and I'm hearing everything arranged in, in that way. When I opened my eyes, it was all about how they were making the sound. So when I was playing with the birds, I couldn't see them at all because they were outside, I was inside. And most of the time when I improvise, I close my eyes and I just, Play. So I'm listening to what's going on. That's what came out. I didn't really, I, I had no predetermined idea about it. I didn't really choose anything. And it's because I have a vast array of musical experiences. So I have a lot of language under my fingertips, mm -hmm. except for heavy metal. Well, but you've been reviewed by <laughs> when I was in a heavy metal well, magazine. How you crazy is that? probably got that too. You didn't, just didn't know. <laughs> I know. I know. But does that, you know, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. 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 Great. Does it explain why the Vikings Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty deep. He said that, um, it's on my website. It's called Frame. Is that, and it, actually that, that review has popped up again in another blog. He writes for frame, it's out of the UK. He said that, you know, he had been a music critic for since the age of the typewriter and that, you know, he can't even count how many music reviews he's done. And then he said that, and then once in a while an album comes through that reminds me why I decided to do this in the first place. And 
then he wrote this incredible review <laughs> of the album. And I'm, I'm the only like non-heavy metal thing on that blog. But I guess it just came across his desk somehow and he decided to put it on there. So it's kind of funny. Anybody else? No? Yes? Oh yeah, so when you had finished kind of recording, so you said you did this for hours yeah. every day. How did you go about cutting it down into like a CD? Well, I didn't use this as the recording. So like what you just heard. That was a compositional sketch. So at night, I would listen to what I did during the day, and then I would decide on what I thought was actual melodic material, harmonic material, structural material, stuff where I thought was just like meandering ad nauseum improvisations, like, yeah, we don't need that. And, you know, and I never actually erased anything. I would just edit it and put it in another track in case I decided, oh, maybe I'll listen to that again. But I would take all of the parts that I liked and out of one session, not multiple sessions, one session. So you never mix uh, pieces from another day so you would always be no. perfect as it is? No, because I kind of am a purist that way. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want to, you know, it's okay if my food's mixed together, I don't want my music mixed together like that, you know. So it has to be from the same session. And uh, although when I'm in the studio, maybe we'll do like three or four takes of a tune. But to me, that's the same session. That means that we're still working on that one piece. You know, if I do it the next day, it's sort of a spiritual thing. It's like I'm in a di different place the next day. I, I want it to be from the same place that I was at at that moment in time. I know that sounds goofy, mm -hmm. but uh, that's kind of where, how I work. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, perfect. Then thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. And probably you will be able to continue your discussions, uh, discussions during the dinner time. Yeah. So then it's now time for Anne Sheka coming to the rest restroom. Anne Sheka is an up and coming artist hailing from the Rhine Main area. He um, happens to be a former student of the Darmstadt University of Applied Sciences. And today he will shed light upon his bachelor's thesis, Waldkindergarten Feature, which um, is a video documentary on um, a certain kindergarten. He will um, also say a few words as he will um, probably would like you to engage with his work and he would like to show you something and he will probably need to put on headphones. But this will, um, I will explain this. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I will not uh, explain this uh, multimedia project for me. Uh, last year I did my bachelor project. Uh, this is uh, called uh, Waldkindergarten Feature. And I will uh, bring you close to this project. So uh, I have here on this poster a QR code. You can see it all of And I have a lot of headphones. You come with your smartphone, scan the QR code, and listen to the project. Uh, have somebody of you not a smartphone? I, yeah. You have not? No, I have a smartphone. You said Everybody has a smartphone? Oh, okay, you don't have one? I don't have one. Uh, what's wrong Everybody with you? Everybody has one? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you cannot connect QR codes? No? Um, for all these people, you cannot scan the QR code. Uh, I offer me to go to the screen uh, after the listening session here, and so we can 
watch on the screen this project together. But the thing is, this is a multimedia project and I will not talk a lot, uh, lot, about, uh, lot about that project. I will set you her watch and listen this project. And after that you can uh, speak about that. Yeah? So when you want, here, you want to start to scan the QR code here, the oh. Mira. Yeah? yeah uh, I uh, can try. You can try? I, uh, okay. How does it work? I believe. You open the photo session. Yeah. You open the photo. And just. And just. And you do not have to be online? Mm, no. Um, yeah. Like, well, I mean, you have to have either data or Wi Fi. Okay. okay. I will try. Like, I have a QR code app. But you can do it simultaneously, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if that one's dark enough. Here, use that one. Um, no, you have to have a. You gotta have the app so it will take you there. I think. I'll show you. Here, watch. Hold on a sec. See, I have this app. You, you gotta have yeah. an app in order yeah. to do it. Uh, make pause, take, grab the headphones, yeah, and start to listen with the headphones. Okay. okay. Yeah. So you need the app. Um, <laughs> I can, I can, I can. You need the QR app. Um, yeah. QR code. I use this all the time to look for sales. <laughs> in the store. <laughs> or information on a product.
I really do. I'm really serious yeah. about that. I'm going to be looking into it. Yeah. In the United States? Right. Yeah, it's a it's a big movement that's yeah. going on. I know, I know. Yeah, I, know. I love it. I know. I'm like, oh, how, how much fun would that be every day playing with preschoolers in the woods? Sure. Right? Sure. It's uh, one of the most healthy few yeah. what, I, what, I, what I see in my life. Nice recording. Thank you. Nice day. I'm going to share it with my friend whose kid goes to Forest Preschool. He's going to dig it. But that was it, right? You put the this is all. That this is all. Okay. Where is the um, preschool at? This is the preschool in Dietzenbach. It's a little town near Frankfurt. Oh, OK. It's a small forest uh, uh, nursery. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's fantastic. I love the voices and the singing. You did a great job on that. Thank you very much. What are those round things that they're carrying on the backpacks? Uh, oh, for sitting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah for sitting. That's what I thought. Yeah. It's that, I love that one kid who's like playing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Do you, now, do you teach there? No, I was only my, my daughter is there. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, you saw my daughter? I would say so. With the glasses, the sunglasses? No, uh, no? Uh, you saw on the on the, on the the pictures where the uh, mixer, Yeah. in front of the mixer. Yeah. This Which one? one? This one. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. She was yesterday here. Uh, oh, in the evening, okay. At the champagne session. 
Now that most of the people are finished anyway, um, you will have some yeah. time left to raise questions. Yeah, we, we are a little bit in time trouble. Sorry for that. Uh, but Sorry. When you have oh, and want, no. Oh, okay. Uh, when you have uh, a question, you can. What, what was is so your project was to film it or? I'm not clear on what it was. It was not clear in the beginning. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the only uh, thinking, think, uh, thinking uh, process was to help this uh, society club. This oh, club yes. For advertisement. Um, oh, support yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this uh, club. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and I don't know at that time how to do it. Oh, you did good. I go deep inside to the group. Yeah. I was one of them. Oh, you were? Yeah, uh, three times a week uh, I was completely in the woods with yeah. the kids and with the educators and at the weekend I go alone in the woods Yeah. four, five, six hours, spend time in the woods, three months long. Yeah. yeah, good job on it. And so the pieces where you can see here, uh, it's like a, yeah, it's like a big puzzle with the all Separate pieces, so it comes one to the next step. Right. And, uh, the first weeks it was clear that I want to go in that that way. Yeah. Did, had you enrolled your daughter I take anyway, or you enrolled your daughter in the preschool because you did this? No, she, she was, was already inside. there. Yeah, oh, she okay. was inside. Yeah. And she's how old? Five, four. She's now six and go to school. Okay. Yeah. And what was her, what did she say about it, about the preschool? She didn't like it and misses it a lot. I bet she does. Yeah. yeah she, in now it. she's in a room, uh, no normal classroom. Yeah. And hates and, it. And uh, hates a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the room, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. I also a question. Is Please. there um, a website or something where one could um, experience your work um, yeah. later? Yeah, you can uh, see a little bit uh, difficult to uh, read it, uh, okay. www.portrait-music.net or you can see it on the link where you have on your smartphone, mm -hmm. my website, yeah. YouTube channel. Nice job. Is that your first film or you do film mm -hmm. regularly? I study here a sound and music production. Oh, really? Uh, and I'm a Saudi, yeah. Okay. But uh, at the beginning of the project, it was clear for me I cannot uh, uh, rent a, a cameraman for this job because somebody must leave this place all day long. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I did it on my own. Um, I couldn't uh, use dance for the camera because the, everything was very fast. So. Um, <laughs> Preschoolers are like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I handle it in my home, everything, yeah. Yeah. But uh, all the people here, you can see from the educators to the ch children. We have the we have the children here on this on the recording studio here in our campus. I recorded the kids here. Um, every everybody, the parents also involved in this project. And uh, you can see here, for example. This uh, instrument, little instrument, what the uh, uh, first nursery use for the kids um, before they start the meal for brightness. Uh -huh. uh, I grab the instrument and record them yeah. and put it into the uh, project. So oh, nice! Everything is close to the to the club. Yeah. Everything. At yeah. the end, I I want one of them and. Uh, the kids are at the beginning uh, wondering about me and my camera, and they stand for the lens. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> what do you do? So, uh, I, I must change my uh, thinking about that. So I, I played a lot uh, in the first weeks with the kids, um, and then so later you can see me here. I have on my headphone two mics here. Uh, yeah, and the, the camera in the hand, so I can I can go everywhere. Uh, so yeah, 
we are ever interested in the uh, at the time, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. Nice job. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Then uh, it's my duty to uh, finish the session 45 sharp. Make sure to get some fresh air outside um, these halls, and then in 15 minutes um, there will be.